Howdy, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Preparedness Podcast, the podcast that brings you the best in preparedness information. You can find us online at thepreparednesspodcast.com. My name is Rob Hannes, and I'm the host for the show. You can reach me directly at rob at prepcast.info. For this podcast, we're going to be talking about good computer security habits. Because this podcast is focused on everyday emergencies, uh, we're not just focused on the apocalyptic or Armageddon, uh, but rather those things that you're most likely to be affected by. Uh, we talked a lot about these uh, these type of disasters, uh, fires, uh, making sure you have the proper insurance, stuff like that. Um, you have a computer. I know you have a computer because you're listening to me on a podcast, which is created and distributed by computers. Now, I suppose a few of you may be strictly uh, via mobile, via your phone or something like that. But probably, even if you don't get my podcast by computer, you're, you have a computer. I mean, most people do nowadays. So it's important to make sure that you're prepared for computer emergencies. Now, I've talked a little bit about this before. I've also talked about how you can use your computer and your mobile devices to improve your organization of your preps. Uh, that actually turned out to be a very wildly popular podcast. Um, I saw it got spread around uh, all over the place, which is good because I think that, um, well, that's one of my goals is to, is to help people as much as possible. So um, this podcast, though, we're going to be talking and looking at some of the better computer habits that you should have in order to uh, minimize the risk that you have from either uh, a computer failure or uh, more likely being hacked or um, having some sort of malware on your computer. Before we get into that, though, um, I want to talk about our sponsor for the podcast, and that is the Legacy Food Storage Food. You can find both of these banners on the website, one for PrepareWise and one for Buy Emergency Foods. The thing I like about them is that uh, they taste good. The packaging is well done. Uh, you look at the packaging, you can tell it's going to last long. And indeed, they have a 25-year shelf life. So what this tells me is that I can buy this food, I can put it on the shelf, and as long as that I meet up my end of the bargain, which is basically keeping it in a stable storage environment, this food is going to be good for a long time. I'm not going to have to constantly rebuy this food every three, four, five years, even seven years. Um, you'd be surprised at how fast that time goes. I have bought uh, bulk foods, uh, freeze-dried foods in a number 10 can, and they have a five-year shelf life on them. And I'm like, okay, five years, yeah, that's that's great. You know what? Five years just flies by, and I'm looking to have to replace this stuff already. If I had bought legacy food with this, uh, the money that I used initially, I'd still have 20 years to go. And that that means a lot to me. That means I can put away this food. I can rotate it out as I need it to make sure that it's good. I can take it camping. I can take it uh, fishing with me, whatever I want, uh, and I don't have to worry about it. It's it's going to be there, and I already know my family is going to eat it because it tastes good, and it's it's very easy to make. Basically, you need to boil some water. You add the food to the water. Uh, you let it simmer. You let it cook, and then it's ready. Um, I find the taste to be very good, and I think it's a, a great addition to anybody's food preparedness plan. They're certified GMO-free. They have a lot of quality ingredients, and I think when you go to the site and you look at, at what they've got there, I think you're going to find that it's a quality product. Uh, everybody I know that's tasted it really likes the taste, and so, again, another high-quality aspect of the food storage program that you need to consider. So go to the website, click on the banners, check out the uh, the details. I really think you're going to find that this makes a lot of sense for your food storage program. Now, with all the cyber crime that we're starting to experience nowadays, if you aren't already employing good computer security techniques and habits, you really should start now. I'm not going to get too deeply into this topic, as you can you can go f pretty far down this rabbit hole, and I don't really want to cover every nook and cranny of this, but I, I do want to cover the basics and maybe a little bit beyond that, uh, as there are, there are some simple things that you can do to really increase your computer security. Now, if you're somebody who wants the maximum uh, amount of security for uh, your computer, you probably already know what it is you need to do. So I don't need to go into every little aspect of this because you probably already are there. Uh, th this is primarily for people who may not have thought about it uh, or have considered it but don't really know where to start. So I think every prepper needs to make sure that they have a minimum amount of security because um, th this is a reality today and you need to be ready for it. 
Now, for some of you out there, some of these terms and, and things I'm going to be talking about are going to glass your eyes over. Uh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, there's plenty of other information here that you can use. So just because I, I, I talk about something, you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, don't turn off the podcast because uh, I bounce around from all sorts of um, skill levels here. So uh, for example, the, I'm going to start off with something known as the principle of least privilege. And this has to do with um, the concept of not logging into your computer with a user account that has admin privileges because admin privileges allow you to install and do everything. And the, uh, the thought behind this is that by logging in as a user that has less privileges, uh, there's less chance of malware being able to abuse those privileges that your account has. I used to use this, or at least I tried this back about a decade ago when I was still uh, using a Windows PC. I didn't like it too much because it was, it was too difficult to constantly do stuff with the computer, especially installing uh, software or anything else that had need or needed admin rights. I constantly had to bounce through to that. Um, it might be better on Windows now. I don't know. I don't really use Windows. I have, uh, I run Windows on my Mac uh, through what's called virtualization, and I use it to run one program for work, and that's it. I don't run anything else on it. Um, I'm not so I don't really know uh, what it can do today. So that's something that you would have to consider. Uh, but that is the thought behind the principle of least, least privilege. Now, having good computer security can protect you on several, several different levels. Um, as I see it, there's the physical. This is preventing data loss uh, and theft if it's your computer stolen or if your computer is damaged. There's opportunistic, which is keeping your computer from nuisance, theft, or pranks. Uh, there's malware, which is viruses and trojans and, and, st and stuff like that. And then there's hacking. Um, hacking does happen. Uh, the less secure a computer is, the more likely that it's going to be hacked. And honestly, you probably won't even know it's, it's happening or that it has happened. So uh, you need to put these measures into place. Um, there are tons of bots out there running on hacked PCs or PCs that have Trojans and, and viruses and stuff. They don't even know it. Uh, and that's part of the problem with where, where all the, our, a lot of our spam comes from. As an example of um, a computer getting hacked, uh, I once co-owned a server with a friend of mine. Uh, he and I were the only two people to have the passwords to the server, and that's the way we, we kept it. All of our clients uh, did not have passwords. We did everything for them. Uh, we called it a secured server simply because um, the clients, though this is the way we explain it to the clients, is that because nobody else but us has the passwords, it's, it's more secure. Well, we got hacked anyways. And we found out because the server started using masses of amounts of, of bandwidth uh, because they were using it for file sharing, uh, files, pictures, music, whatever. Um, the long story short is that they had open access to the server because they had our password. Now, we were really careful to pick uh, a good password, a strong password that is in the dictionary and stuff like that. But what happened is, is that my friend stored the password in the plane. In other words, it was just plain text in a file on his computer, like a Word document or something like that. Now, I encrypted my passwords on my computer so that even if somebody got into it, they wouldn't be able to um, access the uh, the passwords. And that's how I run my system now. And I'll get into a little bit more of that later. But um, what happened was his computer was remotely hacked. They found the server information with the password, and they were able to use it. Uh, this is a very clear case of being hacked. Now, that password could have been bank information, uh, investment information, retirement information. It could have been all sorts of sensitive information uh, that you wouldn't want anybody else to have. And so you need to be careful with your, with your data. One way you can keep people out of your stuff is to choose very good passwords. Uh, you want to choose a long and difficult password. Uh, your passwords are the keys to your digital information. You need to keep them secret and secure. Now, in general, 
uh, length is more important than the randomness of the uh, of the word or the passphrase. But if you could do actually both, that would be better. So a long string of random characters and digits uh, is far better than a sentence, especially if that sentence is well known, like to be or not to be. Another important aspect of passwords is that you should not use the same password for everything, especially uh, your bank account password, your computer account password, uh, any sort of password that you, uh, allows you to get into sensitive information. You should not use that password for your Amazon account, your email account, uh, and stuff like that because once people – get that password, they're going to try that same password in a lot of different places. And um, using the same password for everything is no security at all. Now, past phrases are better than past words. Uh, past phrases are basically a sentence like to be or not to be or to kill a mockingbird, something like that. However, you don't want it to be popular. Uh, you want it to be something that you can remember and something that you can change. So um, maybe Instead of using the word clicker, C-L-I-C-K-E-R, maybe you change it to, uh, it still is pronounced clicker, but it would be C-L-K-R or C-L-I-K-R, something like that. And you can change the E to a three. You can uh, use both upper and lower case. Now, you wouldn't want to use that word on its own, but maybe you have a, a phrase that you come up with that's easy to remember, something like, my clicker is my key to my television. You know, something that's easy to remember, something that, you know, you wouldn't have any trouble um, writing. But then you can start to morph that into a better past phrase. Uh, throw some dates in there, some random numbers, some, some characters, some underscores or, and, and extra spaces, uh, some punctuation and, and other, you know, symbols and stuff. And pretty soon you're going to have a past phrase that is a very good past phrase. Now, where should you use a passphrase like this? Well, quite honestly, everywhere. Anywhere that you have to log in, you would want to use something that's complicated so it can't be hacked or guessed. Fortunately, you can use a software application called uh, a password vault to make this a lot easier. Um, some options are one password and last pass. You can, you can look at those and find out which one may work better for you. I've been using one password for about four years now, and I think it's great. Uh, it allows me to create very long strings of random letters, numbers, and characters for each website, um, that I create an account on. So like Facebook, Twitter, my bank account, um, all these places, even if they're just, uh, some, forum board or something, I usually generate a random phrase of letters and numbers and symbols and stuff. And I have the one password store this. Now to get into my one password, I use a very long and complicated passphrase so that it's, uh, it, it's hard to crack. Actually, it's probably impossible to crack because the, um, all the passwords and passphrases and keys in one password are encrypted with uh, standard AES encryption. So it's going to take a very long time. I mean, measured in thousands of years to break through uh, the password and, and the encryption to be able to get to these passwords. But yet I don't have to remember what they are. For example, my, my Facebook uh, password is a very, very long. I mean, it's the maximum amount that I can put in there. It's an extremely long random string of characters. Uh, I, I couldn't even tell you what it is because it's so long. I don't remember it. I just basically sign in where I want it. I let one password take care of it and then I don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, this provides much, much better security than using my dog is blue or one, two, three, four, five, six, which you would, would be surprised how many people actually use. Now, one of the things I like about one password and, and I'm, I'm assuming there are other password vault apps that do this as well. Uh, but because it is available for PC and Mac and Android and iOS devices. Uh, you can sync all these all these together. So if you did say work on a PC at work, uh, you know at your workplace, and came home to a Mac, and then you had both an Android phone and an iPad, you could basically sync all your passwords on all these devices so that you didn't have to remember them. And it makes it very easy to be able to log into my say my bank account from my iPad, even though I have no idea what my my bank password actually is.
However, I could look it up in 1Password if I needed to actually know what it is. Otherwise, I just log into 1Password and then I let uh, the, the software actually fill in my username and password on whatever website it is. It makes it really quick and easy. Actually, I have it installed for my wife too because uh, it's very easy just to hit one keystroke and have it log in for you. Now, I'm going to have some links uh, in the show notes uh, that you can uh, go to to read these articles about how easy it can be to hack a password, uh, what kind of techniques they use, which I think is important because if you know what they're going to be using to guess or hack into your password, then you can realize how important it is not to use, like, say, for example, dictionary words. Uh, you don't want to spell anything that can be found in any dictionary. Uh, as well as some ideas on on choosing good passwords and how you can you can craft one for yourself. One thing I think is important to do is when you step away from your, from your computer, maybe not at home. Uh, I think home should be probably a safe environment. But if you're at work, uh, lock your computer, whether it's a Mac or a PC, or whatever. This prevents a lot of pranks. Um, because anybody who un d walks away through a computer at my place typically finds uh, all sorts of good stuff on their desktop and, and mouse configurations uh, moved around and stuff. Um, but, you know, anytime maybe we can get into your files, you're allowing the potential of people finding out stuff about you. So lock your computer when you're away from it. If you're not using the Internet, then disconnect your computer from the Internet. This is probably more important for Windows users than it is other operating systems, but it's not a bad idea in general. Uh, I have a friend who has two separate uh, laptops. Actually, I take it back. One's a desktop, one's a laptop. Uh, he uses his desktop for just about everything. He uses his laptop for all his financial and tax uh, information, and that laptop is not connected to the Internet Ever. Uh, that way he doesn't have to worry about anybody hacking in and stuff like that. And, it, and it's one aspect of making sure that uh, your stuff is secure because if, if people can't get to it, then, you know, there's far less chance uh, of being hacked. Another good habit is to evaluate your security settings often. Uh, go over your security settings to make sure that they are still properly set. For example, you may have turned off the firewire to allow a, a certain application to, to run or to access something. You may have enabled Java in your web browser and forgot to, to disable it when you were done. For example, um, if you have to run GoToMeeting or something like that, it needs Java. It's okay to turn it on for that application, but then you should turn it off when you're done. Uh, speaking of Java, the issue that we had recently was that uh, there was a big, huge flaw in it that hackers could use to do all sorts of nefarious things on your computer. It wasn't Java itself that runs on your system um, for other applications. It was the Java from within the web browser. In and of itself, Java is simply like a, a mini operating system that allows developers to uh, build an application and run it on several different platforms. So you can build uh, an application and be able to run it on PC and Linux and, and Mac and not have to rewrite the program for every for platform. So it's it's a handy environment for developers, uh, but it does have some security issues, especially running in your browser. So you should, unless you need it for like GoToMeeting or something like that, uh, have it disabled in your browser so websites cannot spawn a Java, Java applet and start doing things on your computer that you don't want them to do. Another good habit that you should get into is maintaining uh, software and operating system updates. Often these updates are about security and they're increasing security. They found a bug that allowed somebody to do something that they shouldn't be allowed to do and they'll update it and push out, especially with the operating system, whether you're on Windows, Linux, or Mac, you want to make sure that your operating system is up to date. One of the things that I did recently and I really uh, like the concept of is I'm using whole disk encryption on my computer. So in other words, all the contents on my hard drive are encrypted. Um, a lot of times you can secure your, your computer, your operating system, so that you can't log in unless you know the password. And, and that's fine if somebody is trying to get in through your, your computer. But if they rip the hard drive out of your computer, chances are they can access a lot of the uh, files that are on there and just completely bypass the operating system. 
when you encrypt the entire drive, what happens is, is that every bit on there is encrypted. And so even with having access to the drive itself, they can't actually access the data because it's all scrambled as far as they can tell. And without the key, they're not going to be able to break it. Another good thing to do is to use programs that use encryption. Uh, for example, I was using Mac Journal for a while for, uh, for keeping notes and stuff. That had uh, the ability to encrypt individual notes. I love that feature. Um, the system I'm using now, Devon Think Pro, I can encrypt an entire database, um, which is nearly as good. And what this does is I have the encrypted disk, but within the encrypted disk, all the sensitive information I have on there is also encrypted again. So anybody looking at the, the, the absolute hard drive itself is going to see, well, not actually see it, but what they're going to be facing is double encryption. So I've got everything encrypted on the hard drive, and then all my sensitive information is encrypted again within that encrypted hard drive. So I've actually hardened my data fairly well. Okay, let's talk about some some general computer practices that you should be employing on a regular basis. These are just general uh, concepts that you should make good habits. Um, you know, protect your computer against power surges and brief outages. Uh, again, you want to protect not only from viruses and malware and hackers, but you also want to protect your data in case there's a power surge or a brownout. And that fries the power supply, which sends a, uh, a surge to the hard drive and, and wipes out a good portion of your data. So uh, simple you know, power surges or even a, a complete UPS, which stands for uninterruptible power supply, is a good idea. The more sensitive and important your data is, the more you should um, protect it from surges. Likewise, uh, you should be having regular computer backups. You should back up all your data frequently. The more important your data is... Uh, or the more often that it changes, the more frequently that you need to back it up. Now, it used to be long ago, actually not that long ago, uh, it was just the really hardcore computer users, people who, like tax accountants and people who did a lot of stuff on computers that needed to back up, and the rest of us who were pretty much just doing email or web surfing, uh, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of backups to do. Uh, that's all changed with like uh, video and digital cameras and stuff like that. Um, even if all you have is pictures of your kids, uh, to me, that's some of the most precious digital data that I have. And I go to great lengths to make sure that um, I, I back that information up. And I'm pretty sure I have a podcast all about backing up at some point. I think it's one of the earlier podcasts. You may have to go dig for it. Uh, I'm not going to bore you now with that. Suffice to say that you should have probably three different levels of backups. When you're installing programs and applications, you should always know when something is going to be installed. Uh, if you didn't request that an app or a program install, don't approve it. For example, every time something gets um, installed on the Mac, uh, a window pops up that asks for your password to basically give it permission to install. And, it, and unless you type that password, it can't install. That's one of the reasons I like the Mac OS. Um, so if I'm doing something and suddenly I have this window pop up that says, hey, such and such wants to install, type in your password. I would know that uh, unless I expected that to happen, I know that something is um, something's going on here. Now, I've never had that happen, but that is what it would tell me. One thing I started using recently, uh, not so much here at home, but uh, even at uh, my place of work, is a VPN, which stands for a virtual private network. Um, when I'm on my home network, it's a safe network. I've taken the precautions to make sure that it's a pretty safe network. Um, and, uh, you know, I have a long, complicated password to get onto my Wi-Fi. Uh, my router restricts which devices can actually access the Wi-Fi. So I've made it pretty hard for somebody to hack into my network here at home. Um, so I'm pretty safe on there. I'm not really worried about it. However, at work, um, I don't know who's sniffing the network. Um, I, I'm, not in I'm not in control of the network, so I don't know how much security that they're putting there. Uh, not to mention that some of the employees there themselves could be sniffing the network because they're, you know, that sort of uh, mentality where they've got the information, the technology, and they just do it because it's fun. Uh, I use a VPN, and what that does is it, it makes an encrypted tunnel between me and uh, a server someplace, and basically all my information goes through there. So. 
um, anybody who's sniffing my packet, that is what it's called, sniffing packets, they can't see my data. It's all encrypted. And so uh, that's, I use it at work, but especially if you're traveling, if you go to Starbucks or an airport or something like that, you should use a VPN. You should not use the hotel free Wi-Fi unless you have a VPN because you don't know who is on that network. Uh, you can also get VPNs for your iPhone, your Androids, your iPads, and I, I highly recommend using those as well. Now, some of the better VPNs out there are going to cost money, but they're not terribly expensive. Uh, I use Whitetopia.net, and I think I'm paying, it's either 40 or 60 bucks a year, uh, something like that. And uh, I like it because it, it's secure, and I can use it on all my devices if I want. I can also use it uh, on the Windows that I run in virtualization, so... Uh, everything I have coming out of my computer is encrypted, so it, they, it can't be sniffed. A huge practice you should get into is being very careful when you're web surfing. You have to be cognizant when you're surfing the Internet. Uh, don't go to websites that are shady or known to have malware. Uh, you know, things like adult sites and file sharing sites, which are also commonly known as where sites. Uh, you're just asking for trouble. Um, antivirus programs. If you're on Windows, you should be running an antivirus program all the time. If you're on a Mac, uh, honestly, you probably don't need it. But I would suggest that you consider it because um, a lot of times you have to interact with people who are on Windows. And I get, I mean, I get a lot of viruses coming in through email um, that get picked up. I run a, a program called Clam XAV, and I've got it configured to scan. Uh, several folders on my system, and these are where uh, files are incoming. My Dropbox, um, I have my email folders, uh, my downloads folder, and, and the folder that I share with Windows are all scanned by this, this software, and it's constantly finding and deleting uh, Trojans and viruses in these emails that I get. Um, now, they wouldn't affect my, my system. They're, it's completely immune to it. But if I was to pass that email along to somebody else uh, who has a Windows uh, computer, then they could get infected by it. So I like running it um, just for that aspect to kind of help keep, like, you know, the, the work environment clean as possible. Speaking of Dropbox, I love Dropbox. I think it's a really great service. Uh, it's what you call a cloud service. If you use a cloud service like Dropbox or Google Drive, um, you have to understand that you're, you're giving a third-party service permission to access your computer. Now, a lot of these services add uh, tons of functionality to your computers, to be able to, to store files offline for quick and easy backups, uh, share files with other people and stuff. And all this is great, but you need to be cautious uh, with what you're doing, especially if you're giving or granting permission for somebody else to access one of your uh, your folders, like let's say uh, you grant somebody to uh, access a folder in Dropbox. Well, whatever they, whatever files they put in there are going to be immediately downloaded to your computer. So you need to be careful of who you're giving permission to. Uh, I would hope that you're trusting them because you're kind of opening them up. Now, not to say that anything they drop there is going to immediately destroy your computer, but if you were to run it, uh, you could be, you know, inviting in that sort of stuff into your system. Now, one question or topic that always comes up when people talk about computer security and, and stuff like that is, uh, should you encrypt your messages? Or in other words, should you send messages that are encrypted, uh, like email and chat? Now, as far as I can tell, there are two schools of thought on this. Yes, you should, because it secures your privacy. Uh, the other school of thought is no, because it sends a red flag that you have something to hide. I can't make that, I can't make that to determination for you. You need to decide whether or not you want to do that. Uh, you can easily encrypt emails and chats and stuff. It's not very difficult. At the very least, you can probably run it through some sort of SSL. Like your email, you should be set up so that when your email is, is uh, checking the server, it's doing through an SSL connection, not over plain text. What that does is an SSL encrypts, it makes an encrypted tunnel between you and the server uh, that you're connecting to so that only uh, you and the server can connect. 
Uh, that's the same thing when you go to a website like an e-commerce site in the shopping cart. You'll see that the URL starts with HTTPS. That means you're using uh, an SSL encrypted tunnel to make that transaction, and it helps provide security. So your email should be set up that way. But whether or not you should send the actual emails themselves or, like, say, chat like AOL or MSN or Skype or whatever. So the question is, is should you send encrypted text uh, as messages and stuff? Well, you know, it depends on, I guess, how sensitive the data is. Um, I don't personally think that much of what I send in email is sensitive enough to encrypt. The stuff I want to encrypt, uh, like if my tax accountant asks for my SSN or something like that, you know, I don't send it over text. Uh, excuse me, I don't send it over email because it's, I don't think it's secure enough. At the same time, I'd like to be able to send him that encrypted. Uh, but the problem is, is that we haven't swapped keys. So even if I sent him something that was encrypted, he, he wouldn't be able to decrypt it because we haven't gone to that yet. Uh, and it doesn't seem to happen often enough for me to do what I end up doing is I just call him on the phone and I give him that information. And that is just about as far as I want to take uh, this topic. Uh, I know some of you who have made it this point, you might be thinking, really, computer security, is that really a, a prep item? I think it is. You know, you keep a lot of information on your computer, at least I do. I keep a lot of my prep notes in the computer. I keep all my sensitive information, all the backups I have for passwords and stuff like that. It's all on the computer, and uh, I, I don't want that to fall into the wrong hands. I don't want it to be hacked. And so I think a lot of people out there, a lot of preppers in the same boat. We're on the computers all the time. We've got all this information, um, and it is one of those everyday emergencies that we need to be prepared for because, again, like I said, the everyday stuff is most likely what's going to get you. So in the meantime, I want to thank you for downloading and listening to the podcast. One of the things you can do to, to help us out is to spread the word. A lot of people ask you, hey, what can we do to help? Can we, can we donate money? Can we, you know, whatever. Um, one of the biggest things is to, you know, uh, support our advertisers if they have products or services that you're looking for. But one of the big things you can help us with is getting more listeners to the podcast. Uh, that's something that would really help the podcast grow and we can get the message out to more and more people about being prepared and how they can go about doing so. If you are on Facebook, uh, think about liking us on facebook.com slash preparednesspodcast. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, we are there as PrepCast. You can always email me directly, rob at prepcast.info. And until next time, enjoy life and be safe.